know that birds in South America visit later. So usually that they visit them is up in the air. They're, they're now saying one thing they used to say another, but you know, that's evolving and we're learning more. But we you know that they're going there for a purpose. Some kind of kind of behavior. Birds need as much choice as they possibly as we can possibly offer because their needs are always changing and we don't know what they are. Um, birds make many of their choices based on color as well as light reflected. So they're viewing the food that we're feeding in a different way than you are. You're the consumer, you're out there purchasing the foods, but they're viewing them differently uh, because they see the world in, with UV light as well as the regular RGB spectrum that we do. So we cannot replace their diet in the wild. That's just not possible. Uh, it would be great if I could have acai berries and palm nuts all shipped up every week for my birds in South America. We know that's not possible. But um, we so we need to do a lot of substitutions. So the whole diet, the whole promise of feeding birds is substitution. Micromanaging is not the answer. Um, there are people who sit at home and calculate every single thing they feed their birds and put it into a computer and balance the amino acid profile. Now, I don't know about you, but I have a life. I like to sleep once in a while. So, my energy is not an answer. You're going to drive yourself crazy and you're going to drive your birds crazy. So, my whole philosophy is to offer as much diversity as you possibly can, and you will cover those bases. So when I talk about animal foods, I'm going to talk about the protein groups, fats, carbs, and proteins. Now, some of you probably have been to a veterinarian or some kind of expert that has told you, oh, fat's bad, you need to have a low-fat diet for your birds. That is the worst possible thing you can do. And that's because we can't anthropomorphize our diet, we humanize bird diets. Because, oh, well, you know, my doctor told me that fat's bad for me, so it must be bad for my birds. It's not. And actually, we're finding it's the sugar that's killing humans, it's killing us all the time, and not the fats. So we have, we have a lot to listen. Some people have been telling this for a long time, and no one's been listening. Now we're starting to listen, because the, uh, the hard research is, is telling us a lot of stuff. So fats, carbs, and proteins are needed by everybody. It's how much of each is it up in the air. So when I do a consultation for a zoo, and this zoo called me and said our birds, our golden kind are being terrible, and you're all bird, you're all bird people, so you, you know how to pick up on things. What do you notice about this picture? What sticks out? Fluffed up, feather quality's awful. Okay. So I look at a lot of different things. Now the reason they call it is the feather quality is awful. So I look at the environment first, and the environment was dreadful. Okay, now this is a huge Asian accredited zoo who are experts. Okay. So I walk in and I see this. The light is just halogen lamps, terrible lighting. Um, there are enrichment items that you can see in there. It's great that they, they're giving enrichment items, but they're unused. They're completely untouched. So sometimes they're not using their enrichment items for some reason. They have an S box, and these are sibling birds. And I asked, why do you have an S box and your sibling birds? And they said, well, because it's for enrichment. Okay, there's other types of enrichment. Not, you don't want to instill breeding behavior. Every time I see a bird tent or a happy hut or you know, something like that, I'm like, no, don't, don't. Birds in the wild sleep on a perch. That's where they're most comfortable. Uh, so there's all kinds of things that are wrong, but I ultimately look at the diet. And when I look at the diet, they were giving the same pellet every day and one fresh food item per day. And one fresh food item on Monday was spinach, and on Wednesday it was onions. And I said, okay, we need to talk. <laughs> so I talked to them about diversity and that they need a lot more choices. And that these birds, golden kinders, they're basically macaws. They're in the same, they're, they're more closely related to a macaw than they are. Like I said, macaws have a high fat need. So you're giving them no fat. So they really desperately need some kind of fat. So I went back a few months, they said, yeah, our birds don't look any better. And I said, well, did you increase the diversity? And they said, oh, yeah, see? And they showed me, well, they increased the diversity. They give a different pellet every day. And one kind of per bird. Okay, we're making progress. That's bad. So I said, okay, well, we need to do something that is going to be convenient for you to do. Because I know the student has a ton of animals to take care of, and they, they want to do their best. 
Uh, but they have a PhD human as that word, and the human nutritionist is telling them what to feed their animals, which is, which is just plain bad. So I said, okay. Uh, the nutritionist refused to meet with me. She wouldn't be in the same room with me because she doesn't like what I have to say. So I said, okay, well, here's what I would recommend, and then you can take what you will. So they took, um, she started off with flaxseed oil. And flaxseed oil, I know they agreed to the their parents, okay, that's good. Uh, and then they started offering a little bit of coconut oil. And I'm a coconut oil fanatic, so I said, okay, this is great. So they, the version was much, much better, but they still have a lot. I still think their version is surviving, and I want them eating better. So, you know, bird, birds, birds often hide things until it's too late because they're prey animals. But the pets we have at home that are carnivores that don't have to hide their, their you know, where they kill their pets. Dogs and cats, they're like the big babies. Dogs especially the big babies in the animal world that they're sick and everybody knows that. Okay? So, how do you know this dog is not feeling bad? Attitude, face, posture, the way it feels like, its stance. This, this dog is unwell. But this is the norm. How many people have seen a dog like this? It's the norm. And it's because we're feeding them a dry food. And that is not biologically appropriate. Okay? We are systematically killing our animals by feeding them those types of things. Now, um, even our reptiles, okay, and reptiles are a Huge, huge portion of the pet population because they're, they're pretty easily managed. But these are gorgeous self Um and I'm trying to get mine to look like this because they came from a, a situation where they weren't fed properly because they, they end up looking something like this. And you can see the pyramids in the shell, those scales, that is because they're given an inappropriate diet. And, and they should look like that top picture there. So, our goal is to give them as much dry, raw, whole food in its original form. Okay? Now, how many of you know that it's common sense that raw, whole food is better than processed food? Okay, so this should be no surprise. So, when we start applying this to our animals, people really freak out. Okay, I was just telling somebody, I was just telling a story over here. Somebody once told me a thing. Because I'm feeding raw food, live food. And I said, since when is that, since when is processed food better than the raw stuff? I don't know, maybe, maybe it's just. How's it a prettier box? Sorry? How's it a prettier box? It's easier. It's easier. It's easier. It's the kids easier. Okay, so what zoos and animal breeders have taught us, and breeders, especially bird breeders, have taught us a ton of information. Tons of information on breeding because they have a large sample size over decades that we should look at. And they've taught us a lot about um, food. So, zoos and animal breeders have shown us that eating a lot of raw foods increases longevity. Now, this is Adrian. Adrian was the oldest tiger in captivity we have her up at North Field Zoo. She was 20 years old when she died, which is twice as long as wild tigers. Okay? We have an honor number that's 25. She's geriatric, but she has a really good quality of life. 25 is twice, over twice as much as the honor leopards live in the wild. Okay? Um, this one right down here is Satan. <laughs> Satan, is the old, Satan was the oldest humble penguin in captivity. She died when she was 40 years old. That's almost three times as long as some penguins live in the wild. And some of you know Cookie Cockatoo from her field too as well, 82 plus years old. Okay? Now, what does Cookie Cockatoo like to eat? Everybody was down on Cookie Cockatoo for so long. Oh, she just likes to eat seeds. Oh, no, seeds. She's eating seeds. Well, guess what? Seeds are better than some processed food because they have usable fat. It's part of her diet, not her whole diet, but it's part of her diet. So we're learning more and more and more about what raw foods do. All of these animals eat raw, uncooked, unprocessed foods, and it shows in their longevity. Okay, so even the American Veterinary Medical Association, and I have some disagreements with them as far as feeding, but even they have 
broken down fats into two categories, facilitated fats, which are saturated fats. Now, some of your doctors probably are still stuck in the 1980s. Actually, most of your doctors should be, because they say saturated fats are bad, and you should eat saturated fats. And now we're finding saturated fats are good. It's just the type of saturated fat. So something like coconut oil, that's a saturated fat, it's wonderful. We're hearing more and more that raw whole butter is much better than alternatives, okay? even though we were told for, for decades that it wasn't. So facilitated fats are often added to food because it increases the palatability and it tastes better. And just think French fries, right? French fry touches your tongue, you're like heaven, right? It's all, oh, it's facilitated fat, it's wonderful. So facilitated fats are often added to pet food in order to make them taste better. But it causes a severe imbalance in these fat measures. And here's why. Functional fats are what we call essential fatty acids. Probably the one in the news the most is omega-3 fatty acids. Has anybody heard of omega-3s? They have a million different health benefits. All of us should be uh, taking omega-3s. Um, omega-3s decrease inflammation. But the omega-6s facilitated fats increase inflammation. So, our bodies are full of inflammation, especially in this country, because we're eating lots of things that are biologically inappropriate, like meat and things like that. So, we're not adapted to be eating those things, and yet we eat a lot of them, a lot of them every day. And that causes an increase in inflammation. Plus sugar, there's sugar in everything, right? You can't, you can't get away from sugar. Someone says, oh, I shop at Trader Joe's. I said, I go through Trader Joe's, and I can't find anything without added sugar. Look at their nut butters. You can't find any nut butter there without any sugar. It's crazy. That increases your inflammation. Now, inflammation is a normal immune response. You need inflammation. But an overactive immune system is just as dangerous as an underactive immune system. So you need that balance, and the only way to balance it is by giving your healthy fats. And those are harder to get, and your, your pets are no different. So coconut oil is one facilitated fat that's healthy. Now, coconut oil is one of the richest known sources of medium chain triglycerides. And those are short fat chains, and the shorter the fat, the easier it is to burn in your body. You don't store it as fat. So people are like, oh, I want to take coconut oil and make me fat. Actually, it burns fat. Okay, and I, you, some of you have heard me say I've lost 85 pounds in 10 months. I was taking three to four tablespoons of coconut oil every single day. I still do. And it is huge benefit because it doesn't tax your pancreas. It doesn't force your pancreas to be churning out insulin to control all the sugar that your body's having to deal with. So you get this nice steady surge of energy all day long without this crash and burn like you do from sugar. So it's really efficient. For your birds, it is super, super, super efficient because they have a really fast metabolism. And I've had people tell me, well, my birds don't get much exercise. You know, they're not at the lab flying four or five miles a day. Birds still have the highest resting metabolic rate of any animal. Resting, at rest, their heart is humming because it's being stopped. So they still have a fast metabolism. So if you're giving them really good, healthy fats, you're doing them a big service. Um, so it's highly digestible. Yeah. When, when we get coconut oil, what, what should it say on the bottom? That's the last bullet on this slide. Yeah. <laughs> I'm already anticipating it, so I'll tell you. Uh, so it's, it's really digestible. Uh, we added to the formula first so that they can better um, absorb their, uh, their uh, nutrients. Uh, it converts to instant energy, like I said. Um, I lost my mom last year to pancreatic cancer. Uh, she was diagnosed six weeks before she passed. Pancreatic cancer, very aggressive. But she, was, she lived on diet soda her whole life. And diet soda is one of the worst things you put in your body. It actually puts weight on you because it tricks your pancreas into secreting glucagon. So get off the soda. No soda drink tea, trust me. It's, it improves your life a lot. Um, but it, your, your uh, coconut oil doesn't need your pancreas to work and do over and over diet, basically, because it uh, gives you the energy without it. Um, you can eat it without risk. It doesn't denature. It's one of the fats that doesn't denature at high temperatures, so you can actually eat it. Um, it's an excellent sort of source of lauric acid. What lauric acid is, is um, it's a compound that is antibacterial, antifungal, and antiviral. Now, I work around disease carriers all day. They're called 14 year olds. <laughs> and I haven't had cold or flu in six years since I started my coconut oil regimen. 
Um, it makes a huge difference, huge difference. Um, it reduces the risk of cancer because you are reducing your inflammation. Okay? So it helps with that. It also helps reverse your cholesterol. I reversed my cholesterol 40 points in less than four months. Um, she, my doctor was like, what did you do? I go, do you want to know what I did? He goes, yeah. I go, I did everything you told me not to do. I took coconut oil. He's like, coconut oil is all fat. I'm like, yes. And it's the type of thing that does this. I'm like, there's 1,500 published people studies on coconut oil derivatives. Try reading once in a while. You're a doctor for me. Um, relieves arthritis. I can talk to him like this. I've known him for 20 years. Um, he relieves arthritis because, once again, it's going to reduce inflammation. Um, it helps balance metabolism and hormones. Um, some of our birds are hormonal. Right? Especially if you have a male Amazon. They're all 11 months out of the year, usually. Um, but they, uh, especially if they have the word yellow in there. But they, um, our cells all have hormones that are managers. They're called icosinates. And if you don't have those managers to, you know, take care of the hormones that are coming and going throughout the body, it's chaos. It's absolute chaos. So um, hormones need to be balanced at the cellular level, and your coconut oil will help you do that. Um, it helps prevent or diabetes, obviously because it's not you know, using your pancreas at all. Um, it helps rejuvenate the skin, fetters, uh, fur for your pets. Um, you know, I, my dogs all came to me with a host of different medical conditions. Um, all of them get yeast infections and in crevices in their face and things like that. They get dermat they get, uh, um, you know, dermatitis and things like that. Within three weeks, all of it went away. It never came back. Uh, helps maintain bone density, something that's really great for women with osteoporosis, but also animals with hollow bones, or I don't know, like birds. So a bird lays an egg, and it depletes something very, very quickly. So this helps maintain a healthy bone density, which is better for calcium. Uh, reduces uh, allergic reactions, because that's what you get from the inflammation. Um, and it's lowering calories than most of fats. So when you purchase it, only purchase organic. Organic is better, okay? Um, cold or color press. And that's really all you need to know. Now, I have not seen any material available on a shelf at any store that's not cold or color press. So if you're purchasing it at Sam's Club or Costco or Whole Foods or whatever, it's really all the same stuff. There's no chemical products really in coconut oil anymore. Um, so it's pretty easy to get. Um, and you can now get liquid coconut oil. And a liquid coconut oil, they just add more of those medium chain triglycerides, which is great. That just keeps the liquid longer because at room temperature, it's, uh, it's a solid. And then at 76 degrees, it melts into a liquid. So it's usable. Yeah. <laughs> Most coconut oil. Yeah. Um, the, the, what was the question? What, the question was, what is a non-organic coconut oil? Like, what is it? I wish I could answer that question, but because of the loose, um, <laughs> the loose rules for labeling organic in this country, that's a really difficult question to answer. I work with the these things are really interesting, non organic right? Yeah, well, that's why, I mean, I tell people to buy organic if they can. You probably went through a more stringent process, but it probably doesn't matter. That's why I focus on the cold urge Okay, I know you, I feed a, a flock, and and I guess I had never asked the question. I incorporate coconut oil. I put eggs in it. Shake it. Put some caramel eggs in it. And then it also does its warm. I put it all over the entire markup, what I'm feeding, yep. and that came out. Came out over all my stuff that I'm putting in the, in the bowl. How much should I be trying to? I'm feeding a big group. There's no way to measure how much birds are ingesting. About, are you putting like a quarter of a cup, or are you putting about half a cup? I have 13 birds. So much food that they're going to get too much coconut oil. I don't. I've never ever seen a. I just want to make sure I'm getting. 
Yeah, and I, I would not worry about overdosing. Uh, what I do is I put it on just so it's enough to coat everything right, she, that I want oh, visually, because right. that's all you're going to do. Now, okay. if you've got a single word, you know, something like uh, a, a macaw, half a teaspoon per day, more than enough. Um, for smaller birds like cockatiels, few drops, parrotlet, few drops, um, conyers, quarter of a teaspoon. So you know, just they, that's it, it gets ingested. Right. There's going to be tons of left course. over, but yeah. I mean, yeah I just, and your three tablespoons a day. I am up to. I will take a tablespoon because it's taken a long time to get uh, get through that. Did you say animal training successful vaccinations? Do you do it three times a day, or do you do stuff all the time? I do it all. I, I typically do it all once in the morning. Yeah. Okay. Um, because I want to. I teach. I can't need that energy. I was going to ask you how do you. If you put your on food or not, you put it on food. I don't think so. Do you put it all on food? It, it depends. Some of it has a other taste. Some brands have a stronger taste. Uh, but I just throw it in my food. Yep. Could you just put it in a spoon and act like sure you're eating it? Because she will eat things that she thinks I'm eating. Yep. Um, I, I, I have told you all at home. Allergies, 
Dog should get allergies. It's a, it's a response to eating inappropriate food that they're not adapted to digest. Um, if your dog is pooping large piles, they're just bad, they're wasting your money. They're pooping out all the time. They're getting very, very little out of that. And when you put them on a raw food diet, they poop little tiny dry pellets that just disappear. And I know because I've seen it in the uh, Needed for absorption of key vitamins. These are the things that help you absorb the vitamins that are fat soluble. You have to feed it. Vitamins have to get it in their diet. That's the only way they can get this. The problem with omega 3s, especially, is that they are inactivated. They denature if they're exposed to light, such as in a food bottle at a grocery store on a shelf. They're, um, if they're exposed to heat, they denature above 100 degrees like that. Processing of any kind and agitation. If you take the bottle too big, they denature. So they're very, very sensitive. The best way to get the omega 3s are from the source. For you eating fish, for you eating nuts, okay, for your birds eating seeds and nuts, um, and, and even mealworms and things like that for your birds have omega 3s in them as long as they're alive and they're, you know, they're healthy. So omega 3s are very difficult to get because they're inactivated so easily, but if you're feeding a whole food, they're very, very easy to get. So omega 3s are needed for your cells to reproduce and replenish the dead cells, replenish dying cells. And your cells die constantly and they have to be replenished. Uh, production of glycosinoids, which are those super hormones in the cell that manage the other hormones that come and go. Uh, so that is regulating hormones, regulating immune response. Um, if, if, somebody's, if somebody has allergies, you need to be giving them healthy omega 3s. Deficiency in omega 3s, stunted growth. And I, we were talking to dinner last night. The only those that taste special is that they stunted growth. They're smaller in body size, smaller, their head is much smaller. Because uh, they weren't getting omega 3s like they needed early on. Uh, vision impairment, hearing coordination, and then immune system responses, allergies, cancers, and things like that. So, you need to be a biologically appropriate omega 3. So, for the penguins, we give them an animal based omega 3 called fish. Okay? That's where they get their omega 3s. Um, and yes, he nailed me right after this. Um, for carrots, we typically use a plant based omega 3. That seems to be more absorbable. So, um, best place is nuts. Some seeds have um, omega 3s that you can use as well. Uh, and this picture here is of my black cow cockatoo. This is Rick Jordan feeding. He's uh, he younger. Uh, but in this formula, he has finely chopped walnuts so that the birds can start, their digestive systems can start to learn how to break down that food more efficiently. Uh, so animals, yeah. At what I age? Uh, sorry? At what age does he start that? Uh, many, many? Pretty young. Yeah, with his macaws, he's, with his macaws, he's doing it fairly young, yeah. yeah. Uh, and I mean, that's what the parents are feeding. Oh, I know. He's out of a, a nest box, and he eats rice that's in the crop. Oh, I know. <laughs> I've seen it packed chock full, yeah. Um, <laughs> no, for, uh, nuts in the freezer should not destroy them. Yeah. If, if the freezing freezing can compromise the integrity of the food, which means it, it changes the texture, which could change the healthability. Um, but freezing them That's typically doesn't mind. Yeah, it's, 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 it's nuts, nuts are usually the culprit, it's usually the fruit. Uh, so, uh, hypoxyphenoic acid and hypoxyhexanoic acid, and you are going to all have to repeat those things later. So, uh, EPA and DHA are the um, animal sources for omega 3s. Now, we as humans, the research has said that we do better with animal based omega 3s. Grill oil, grill, little sea creatures, best source of omega 3s. A thousand to two thousand milligrams every day. Okay, so we're we're talking animals. Uh, and you get some from plant based like flaxseed oil. You can, but you're going to do better. Humans are going to do better with uh, dogs and cats. Absolutely have to have animals. Don't don't give your dog or cat flaxseed oil and expect because their body is not adapted to eating all that high fiber, that high fiber waste. 
Now, with birds, we offer uh, golf and LA guesses, ALA, so this is, this is what's ah. seen the nuts and things like that. Omega-6s, you still need. And omega-6s are things like sunflower seeds. Sunflower seeds are good. They just shouldn't be the whole diet. That, that's the problem with always yes. But sunflower seeds, normal skin capability, um, healthy strong feathers coming out of that skin, uh, normal reproduction, and proper organ function, especially those organs that do have a filtering function, like liver, bladder, kidneys, things like that. Deficiency in omega-6 causes failure to gain weight. And that's why typically if a bird is growing it's not gaining weight, it's still got some flower seeds and, and things like that to bulk it up. Um, but you need the omega 3s to keep it at that level. Okay, getting it there is one thing, but keeping it there is another. Liver and kidney problems usually are a result of omega 6s. Um, if you have a cat, most cats um, in this country die of kidney cancer or cancer of some type. Sometimes both. Kidney failure is because cats are at a dry kibble for the most part, or a processed canned food, and that means that their kidneys shut down. And then what the vet's response is, well, let's put them on a prescription diet by this company that is specifically, and guess what, it's low protein, because the kidneys have been so wrecked. I don't know if you know this, but cats are carnivores. They shouldn't be on a low protein diet. And that's, it drives me crazy when I hear this, because it's a very simple thing. The cats that don't die of kidney failure are the ones that are let outside to eat whole prey like mice. Those are the healthiest because they're getting all their nutrients in one package. And we don't want your cat. You don't want your cats outside. They destroy. They destroy wildlife like crazy. They're a predator. But those are the healthiest ones. So you know, changing your cats and dogs over to a lot of food diet much better. Um, it does result in behavioral issues like what? Yeah. I just wanted to say about the cat with the kidney disease. I have a almost 18 year old cat that two years ago was diagnosed with terminal kidney failure. Given me less, less than three months survival. I switched him to a raw, frozen raw diet, and that's his primary diet. He's two, two to two and a half years going, and he's going strong. It's made a huge difference. Yeah, I can't tell me you will kill your cat and switch it to raw food now. It needs to be on a low protein diet. <laughs> so, yeah. 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 My grandson has a raven. Uh, white collar African raven, and the breeder told him to eat dog food, nothing but dog food. Yes. Is that, that doesn't sound right. Ravens are, ravens are omnivorous, but they're largely carnivorous. They're going to eat a lot of protein, but they should not be on top of They should be on top of the Yeah, I mean, typically ravens are fed things like pinky mice and things like that. That's okay. so many kind of gross, but that's why I like so to eat them. Or something else. Right. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Um, the one more thing, we see this a lot, uh, especially in birds that have self mutilated to the point where they're bleeding, um, and that could be some of omega 6 deficiency as well. Um, infertility and poor coat and feather development, as well as scaly skin, dermatitis. Dermatitis, the skin is the window to the soul sometimes. It's all a lot. And if they have scaly skin, there is a fat deficiency in their diet. So you need to balance omega-3s and omega-6s. Now, this is a part. Omega-6s, you have no problem getting omega-6s in your diet or your pet's diet. Omega-6s are useful. But if you're, you've got such an imbalance, if your omega-6s are tipping the scale, and omega-3s are almost getting no omega-3s in our diets. That's the problem in our country right now. Instead of solving it nutritionally, we're solving it through medicine, which is not working. Uh, so omega-3, you definitely need some kind of omega-3 in your diet and your diet. So where do you find it? So omega-6s are readily available. Seeds, omega-6s are plentiful. Uh, soy. soy is also a source of omega-6s, which is why so many pet foods use soy. Uh, I stay away from soy myself because it's high in estrogen. And that can cause hormone imbalance. Um, but omega 6s are easy to get in most bird diets. They're, it's a non issue. Omega 3s are more difficult. So you can get omega 3s from nuts. And I'm curating nuts with me everywhere I go. 
always have Brazil nuts and almonds and walnuts and stuff like that. I always have them because if I have them, I'm more likely to eat them. They're readily available. Um, for your birds, the best way to get them is eating. For smaller birds, you can stop them, crush them for your smaller birds as well. That's an option. Pumpkin seeds, especially green pumpkin seeds, are good, excellent. Um, and then, now, someone asked, well, can I just feed my bird flax seeds instead of flax seed oil? You can. But flax seeds are extremely fiber, so your bird will get to eat a lot of flax seeds and you can get enough oil to make a difference. You have to grind so, it though, don't you? Uh, it's a, more helpful if it's ground because then it's more available. Yeah, the oil is more available. But they but can't even get then, it. it's still fibrous. Lots and lots of fiber. So I take flax seeds, I eat flax seeds every morning um, with my coconut oil and everything else together. But uh, it's ground. But I'm doing it for the fiber. I'm not expecting any oil that's out of the flax seed. Okay. Um, but it's I mean, seeds that you're going to get a lot out of, chia, hemp and chia are two really good seeds for that. Um, but oils are pretty good um, as far as getting your omega 3 really available. Flax, orange, primrose oil, things like that. Now, what you notice about these bottles is they're enclosed, light can't penetrate. They're in a bottle plastic bottle. They, you would buy these in a refrigerated section of a health food store. Okay? You would not buy these off the grocery store shelf just sitting out. They have to be refrigerated and you have to use them regardless of what the bottle says. You have to use them within a month. Wow. Otherwise you're dead. Okay? So even if you store them in the fridge, you can do everything you want. They're just so fragile that you need to replenish them. So I always tell people, don't buy a big bottle and you can save money. Buy a little bottle and feed it out as, you know, as, as fast as you can. For dogs, cats, birds of prey, other carnivores, uh, we offer omega 6s and raw meat diets. So my dogs at home are raw meat, that's all they get. They're not getting any kibble, they're not begging, they're not starving. They're the perfect weight, they have been since I put them on the diet. Um, and they have no health issues, including hip dysplasia, which one of them has. She's had no occurrence of it. I just don't think she's ever going to die. She's the meanest dog I've ever had. She's going to live forever, I just know it. Um, but some supplementation um, as far as oils go. Yeah. What, what raw diet are you using your uh, dogs? Do you have it on your, I you on your Facebook? Yeah. Um, I, I, we, I only talk about, we only talk about bird diets on Facebook page. Are you going to make one for me? No. I don't want another job. Okay. But, um, so, as far as dog diets, most of the diets that are available, prepared, frozen, and ketchup. So that's usually all the balancing process where the organ meats, there's whole bone, there's uh, muscle, they're all that meat is all ground up together in a, in a nice, easy eating way to do it. Right? Okay. Um, most of them are okay. Uh, making it yourself, you need to go online, you need to do your research, you need to look for a bunch of different recipes. Um, there is a website called realrawdog.com, real R E D L, okay. and you can actually do formulations right there, and they'll blend it for you and ship it right to your house. So there's lots of options. Okay. Uh, but what you definitely that need to do your real? real R E E L, rawdog.com. That's one place to start because you can actually see all the different organs and things like that that you can feed. Yeah. Um, in a nice, easy to feed. No, I like the convenience of the store and buy it. I was just curious yeah. what you, you were having to go Yeah, I've done Aunt Jenny's, I've done Stella Chewy's, I've done Nature's yeah. Variety. I mean, it's all easy to do. Okay. I was told it's soy in that kitchen dog. Soy? Soy? Yeah. I don't feed soy to anybody. Huh? I don't feed soy to anybody. Yeah. And I myself, yeah. The dog. Yeah. Orange is also an herb, and I can get that at work in the herb section as a like plant. What? What is? Or or how do you pronounce it? Um, you have to press it to get the oils from the seeds, I believe. So I I'm not sure how to, I don't I'm not sure how to press the oil. To tell you the truth. Well, I was wondering on the leafy greens of that would that be feeding um, uh, the other greens anyway? Yeah. Would that be a better addition? I don't know what nutrients are specific to the orange plant. It's not something that's readily available to most people in the stores. I'd have to look at that. <laughs> <laughs> 
my protein nibble, and then I try to use raw chicken and vegetables and stuff like that here and there. And I was told by someone who does raw that you either do all raw or you do all green chicken. You can't do it. Um, is that true? No, that's not true, but I will tell you that if you're giving your dogs a dry food, that's what's causing the problem. No, Even if you're stuck in it, uh, it's, um, it's, it's just the dry food that's the problem. Right, I mean, they're not having any problems in the It's convenient to me, uh, and I get like food that you don't want to know about. Yep. But um, I just didn't know that it's all stuff in many ways. Vegetables and, you know, things like that. They said that digestion is different. Digestion is different than. So they said, so I was told that if you kill, it takes so long to digest that. So long to digest that. Then you can like some raw on top of your veggies, some chicken, or something like that. Your raw is just not easier. And I'm going to get all kind of backed up because it takes like four to six hours to digest your raw and four hours to digest your chicken. Uh, there's a lot of uh, health benefits from GI and health, heart health. 
So carbohydrates, uh, birds have a need for carbohydrates. Um, we have a smaller need for carbohydrates. And uh, it's because they're an energy source for a high metabolic rate that birds have. So carbs are broken down into sugars, and if you can't digest the carbs, they're called fiber. The fiber goes through your system, then it comes out the same way it went in, but it helps prime the digestive system and keep it healthy. Um, so what we offer to birds, things like meats and rice and things like that, um, legumes as far as beans go, um, fresh fruits and vegetables, things like that. Now, with beans, um, it's difficult, because beans not only have to be soaked, but they often have to be cooked. Um, so I don't offer any beans to my birds that need to be cooked. I offer birds, I offer the ones that need to be soaked and then somewhat sprouted. Mung and zuki are probably the best. Um, peanuts are also a legume. You should never feed peanuts. There's no reason to feed peanuts. Peanuts cause a lot of issues. Uh, whether they're organic or not, they each have a different set of problems, but peanuts are not enough. Focus on nuts. I was told that uh, sweet potatoes raw are good, and we need them to cook sweet potatoes. So sweet potatoes raw are just fine. They're fine. They're fine. Yeah, I don't, I don't cook them. Um, but I don't, I don't really cook anything for my birds. They can eat the sweet potato raw. A little bit of steaming is going to make some of the nutrients more available, as long as you don't overdo it. Unfortunately, we cook it all the way through until it's. You know, books, and uh, because we think that's what they'll like. Um, but they may, they may like it that way, but it's not the most healthy thing. Uh, you said uh, about uh, giving birds uh, nuts in the shell. Do you have to worry about pesticides on those? You have to worry about pesticides on the shells on the nuts. Um, not generally, some pesticides, but um, generally, not really. Um, and you can wash you can wash them like you would any of your produce before you feed them. Which I do. I just soak them in, the, in veggie wash and then um, and then I just dry them out. So Okay. Okay. Um, and then fresh fruits and vegetables. Has anybody been told that their parents should not eat fruit? Or should not eat a lot of fruit? So, I don't know if you know this, but birds eat a lot of fruit in the wild. There's no reason why they shouldn't eat fruit in captivity. And I've heard people over and over again say, oh, it's so much sugar, and oh, they're not, they're not flying miles. We're anthropomorphizing it, and we're humanizing the bird diet. We have to stop doing that. Birds absolutely have fruit. Uh, so, fruits and vegetables in their raw form are the best source of food. Now, some birds have a high like calories. Fruit eaters, herbivores. Um, this is uh, one of my tortoise beds. They have a huge carb need, so they get piles and piles of vegetation all the time. Uh, lemurs are uh, another one that we have to give a, a high carb diet to. They eat, they're pollinators, and they go from pollen to pollen and they pollinate and collect them and they eat, eat the nectar and stuff like that. So we've actually put the teas. Uh, which are the dried flowers, right into their foods, so they can actually consume them that way as well. We do that for all birds. All birds eat flowers every day now in our diets. Um, we throw the seeds um, right into their mash and things like that, and, and roll them in, and the birds love it. So I work for the Note of Our Nature Museum up in Chicago. This is Celeste Truman. She is the lead biologist there. And they came to me years ago saying, why don't you add birds to our water fly exhibit? And I was like, yay, birds, yes, that's what I'm here for. So um, this just warms my heart, because look at that diversity. It's phenomenal. And they have everything you could possibly imagine. Now, this is an Australian grass finch, a chef. And everybody's like, oh, you know, Australian grass finches, they just eat seed, make a little bit of green, but that's all they eat, that's all they eat. Well, I got news for you. This bird, these birds are eating everything you can possibly imagine. They're picking fruit, they're picking greens, they're picking seeds, they're picking sprouts, they're eating mealworms, they're doing all of that stuff. And they said, well, we were told that, you know, they shouldn't be eating those things. I said, they're eating what they should be eating. And they have, these birds will not stop eating. They will not stop breeding. They're like, it's, 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 the, uh, it's a smorgasbord of uh, fertility. So these birds are teaching us that you know there's a lot there's a lot more to their diet than just dry seed. 
Uh, and then koalas. So this is at San Francisco too. And koalas are specialists. Uh, they're adapted to eat one thing. What is that? Eucalyptus. eucalyptus okay. So eucalyptus um, sounds like a really boring diet, but their digestive systems have evolved over you know, a long period of time to digest that food specifically. But San Francisco Zoo even practices dietary diversity with their koalas. They offer different types of eucalyptus every day, and they rotate through um, so that all the fresh growth is at the top. Because if you think your bird is picky at home, you should have a koala. You shouldn't have a koala. They stink in the food. But they, they, um, they only eat the fresh growth at the top. They leave everything else. They're very picky about the type of the greens, but even they are getting a diverse diet. You mentioned the mealworms. Can you give everybody a suggestion on how to offer the mealworms? Just fresh in the bowl? I, I throw them in a bowl. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> a bowl with sides so they can't climb. Yeah, a bowl with sides so they can't climb. Steel bowl is great. Um, I offer I offer mealworms to every single bird I get. Every day. Every day they get mealworms. Yes. Every bird. No, no, no. Every single bird. I know. I give life. Mealworms are a source of omega threes. They're a source of good, healthy fat. They're a great source of protein. Uh, they are biologically appropriate for your birds. Every single parent that has been watched for any time in the wild has been seen eating grubs or something off a tree bark. They all do it. Um, they scratch to the ground for bugs too. It's a natural thing. Will your birds take to mealworms immediately if they have not been fed them before? No, they, they might not. Um, but I can tell you, my birds figured it out real quick and they eat like they've been eating like a house. So we offer them every day. In the wild, don't the birds uh, kind of blast themselves on what's in season? Yeah, birds work themselves on what's in season. So they, for maybe a month, they might have to take for you. I, I, I can't put a time on that because it's very, very different. But there's some trees in the rainforest that bloom every three years. The birds descend upon it, they gorge on it, and then they don't see for another three years. So um, the, the need for, uh, it drives me crazy when people um, tell me their birds have to have the same thing every single day. You're doing your bird a disservice if that's the case. Your birds need to have different things every day. Otherwise, they turn into these robots that are like, I'm not eating because this isn't what I do every day. You need to keep, you need to have a cycle and give them a diverse diet. And that's why, because they do gorge themselves on different things every day when they're real. What you can't break the cycle? You can break the cycle. It's always possible. Everything's possible. Persistence. 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 I look for such stuff every day. She eats her pellets. <laughs> <laughs> she needs to remove the pellets so that she's eating something else for a change. And then get the pellets back. Yeah. Right. Okay. She eats her pellets and she'll eat apples, but other than when she's hungry. Okay. It's your mindset that needs to be changed more than your trust me. I know I will then. It is. You have to untrain yourself to that they need, you know, think what they need. It's, it's a. Uh, it's more work for us to break the cycle than it is for them. It took six months to get her in the health of the Is it a great or a great? Yeah, it's great. You put a new food in there and they're like, that touches me. And then you give them one thing at a time. I mean, if the week of our birds, if you give them three or five vegetables, you pick out what they want and leave the rest go. So you love the one thing at a time. During the course of a day, Probably. Um, I would make sure they have lots of choices throughout the day, though, because they're going to pick things that they eat. So, um, and I'll show you some pictures of what I think my birds, so you can kind of get an idea um, and how to make this manageable. But this isn't hard. It's some, not hard. Sometimes the size of the portions that you offer them. Yes, the portions. If you, get, if you get them chunks of things, they're going to pick out what's familiar and eat that and ignore the S, but if it's cut smaller, and they count to be ah. the rooting through, they will get the taste of the other things. Yeah, I found mixing things together gets your bird to bigger diversity than if you serve it without anything else touching it. Yeah. Because all of us are, have those birds that like kids where they don't want their meat touching their yeah, fields, right? I mean, they're, they're just like that. But um, we have found that mixing and dicing and keeping things mixed together forces them to make better choices. Well, you mentioned something that on screen when you first started that color makes a difference. Color makes a huge difference. Really? Yeah. 
Earth seeing in all the colors we do, it wants to do the So they're seeing things in a whole different map, including each other. <laughs> What about super worms? I have a sugar glider. Super worms are good for large birds. Um, for like a cockatiel? Yeah, you can offer them super worms. They have more or less the same size. Right. 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 Yeah, that's our one. Um, yeah, so that's a good one. Yeah, and then the round I don't think that was. Uh, that's one of the reasons. <laughs> okay. Uh, I'm gonna go. I have a lot more. So, um, diversity. So this kind of leads into what we were um, saying. Diverse diversity is key. Um, too much of any one thing is not recommended. And I always tell these people who even I see, you probably have line on social media and people are like, oh my god, they're feeding us sometimes, they're going to kill their parents. It's like, they're unhealthy when it's the only thing they're eating. Okay? And that's the problem. Way back then, when everybody was just feeding dry seeds, of course our birds were unhealthy. But if it was in mode during, during that time to just feed fruit, we have a whole different set of health problems. So it's it's diversity that's really, really important for not feeding any one thing too much. So um, the same combination every day is not recommended. You need to keep things mixed up for your birds. Um, when they wake up in the morning, they have no idea what they're going to eat. And always keep the birds by the You want to offer it lots of different things so that they never know what they're going to get. Because that's going to keep them mentally stimulated as well. I know people get their hands up because they're going to attack me for what? Avocado. Guess what? I knew you were going to ask that question. And I put this up here for a reason. Now, I am going to say this. Everybody listen to me. Jason does not recommend feeding avocado. Everybody repeat that. Do not get on social media and say, I just heard Jason recommend avocado. I get somebody do that. It's in the picture. I just had somebody do that last year. They called the zoo at which I worked to try and get me fired because they claimed I was going to kill their birds. I'm like, oh, there's extremists on Facebook. I don't know if you're aware of it. <laughs> So this is this is what so somebody on social media asked me why are avocados toxic? The birds in my backyard in Southern California eat them right off the trees. The birds are not falling out of the sky. And I said birds and trees have been eating eating avocados for decades with no problems whatsoever. Should you feed avocados? No. Okay. Now here's why. Here's why. Avocados in the grocery store are plucked before they're ripened. During the ripening process, naturally, when they're on the tree, the, the person toxins that are in the flesh of the avocado seed into the pit and the skin. So that the flesh is toxin free. But we don't do that with the avocados that we put in the grocery store. What we do with the avocados in the grocery store is we pick them when they're not ripe, they're full of toxins. And then when they're ready to go to the grocery store, they spray them with ethylene. They wash, they wash them through the ripening process, which does not give time for the um, toxin to receive. So because we speed ripening them through that process, once again, processing, it leaves the toxin in the flesh. Now, could you find, could you, I mean, have people in this room probably accidentally fed out cows or fed out cows no, unknowingly to their birds and their birds were just fine? Yes. But it's playing Russian roulette. You have no idea whether the toxin is still in the avocado or not. Okay? And it kills me because avocado is like one of the most nutritious fruits we could be feeding our birds. But because of the processing, they're toxic or potentially toxic, so we can't feed them. Now, should you be guys eating avocados? Yes. You should be eating them. They're, they're awesome food. Awesome food for people. But your pets should not be eating avocados. Have I made that clear? Yeah. I just want to make sure because I don't want to get fired. Yeah. Um, are the organic avocados also sprayed? It doesn't matter. Uh, it doesn't matter. And here's why. When they spray ethylene, uh, 
Ethylene is a plant derivative from something like bananas. And the reason why bananas, when you put them next to fruit, and you ripen that other fruit much faster is because bananas are full of ethylene. That's what makes them go brown. So they spray that. It's a plant derivative. And theoretically, it's not synthetic. It's not a chemical. But it, it is. So, yeah, that's what we avoid. It depends how it's made. According to government regulations, which are largely ridiculous. <laughs> so, okay. So, once again, don't feed avocados. Just eat them yourself. Don't give them your roots. Okay. So, this is my um, this is my kitchen counter every Sunday afternoon. Thank you for inviting me. You're getting me out of this task today. Um, but this is about four to five hours of work for the whole week. And I chop uh, all of these uh, vegetables, sorry, fruit, and um, I layer them, the juice and stuff on the bottom, um, so that they don't make everything else soggy. But um, we do a lot of diversity. Now, this time of year is very frustrating for me because the diversity starts to go down because now all of the produce that's coming in is imported. And what they are allowed to spray in South America on their produce is illegal to use here. Finally, the cyanide-based fungicides that they use on all grapes, all blueberries, and things like that that are available all winter long. You can't wash some of that stuff off. Okay. So, my grandma, all, every, every Christmas, she's got to get her red grapes, her red table grapes, and she rinses them with one and puts them on the table, and I'm just like, oh, excuse me, you know, please, 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 do something about this. But, um, a lot of the food is just, you know, not good. It's just not good from another country. So, look at your labels. In this country, legally, every single piece of produce has to be labeled with the country of origin. If it's South American, Pretty much want to try and stay away from it at all costs. That would be you. Sorry. Frozen? frozen in some fruits is great. I freeze blueberries because my two pants will hold it against me if I don't feed blueberries every day. I feed the blueberries every day, especially if they're feeding chicks. So, that's so you freeze perfect. all your fresh stuff so you don't have stuff in the winter? I do. I do freeze blueberries. Yeah. The, um, the problem with fruits is they don't freeze very well. Um, the melons, like cantaloupe, papaya, kaku, I give them my word, but they don't freeze well. That changes the integrity of the fruit. They won't eat them otherwise. Um, they will blueberries. And blueberries, the research has shown, doesn't change the nutritional content. So we, we tend to stick with that. Um, I do use veggie wash. Um, I soak all my produce at, for a few minutes at least, and then I scrub with a scotch can that is only for my produce. And then I dip, and then I rinse. You have to do both. You can't just rinse. If you're just rinsing in water, you're doing nothing. Because most of the pesticides and herbicides and fungicides that are used are water so they don't have to reapply it onto the crop every time it rains. And most people don't even consider that. And then you realize it's expected to be waterproof. Uh, so we do as much organic as we can. Apples, any apple I purchase is organic. I will never, ever not purchase a uh, not organic apple again. They have 32 different pesticide, herbicides, and fungicides that are used on apples in this country. So I don't, I don't feed any non organic apples. Um, but the other stuff, you know, you, you have to know, you have to know your source, and it's all easy to, to tell. It's big, it's, 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 it's the big bird is big on the top like an apple. Can you just peel it? No. It's a dog. Yeah, things like strawberries. Pesticide sponges, uh, peaches, pesticide sponges. So even if you don't eat it, uh, the, the, one, the one fruits that you usually keep away with it is thick rind, cantaloupes, honeydew, things like that, that's not nearly as bad. Um, usually you don't have to go organic with those, but um, with strawberries, apples, peaches, things like that, very thin skin, goes right through. Yeah. Um, I also grow flowers for them, but um, obviously we can't grow flowers in the ground, so that's where the teas come in, and we offer those flowers and the teas here um, right into their food every day. Okay, so enzymes are, um, there's two types. There's digestive enzymes, which your pancreas secretes in your small intestine, same with your pets, and it, you have to have those um, in order to break down food. Enzymes are proteins that break things down. They're catalysts, they create things happen in the body. Uh, 
They also help with how available the food is, how absorbable the food is to your body. Um, amylase breaks down carbs, lipase breaks down fats, and proteases break down proteins. And we have amylase in our saliva, which is why when you put a cracker in your mouth, it's soggy right away, because the enzyme immediately starts working and starts and breaks it down. Um, birds never produce lactose because they never have had milk. Um, they don't get they don't their mammals. Um, so because they can't produce lactase, they should never have milk. Now, some people say will tell me, oh but my cats love milk. Well, I don't eat some, but I can eat it again, right? <laughs> so um, we are the only mammal that has a genetic mutation that allows us to consume dairy products beyond eating from our mothers. However, who in here is lactose intolerant? Okay? You're the normal one. I'm a human. Because I can, I can handle dairy. I can still handle dairy. If you are lactose tolerant and you can eat dairy without any problem, that means you're a mutant. I love my mutation because I love cheese. Me too. But, um, you know, we are the only mammal that has adapted to that, and that's because our ancestors, it's been traced directly to our ancestors through genetic um, in Africa that says both people that could drink milk would survive drought. They could drink milk during the rest of the drought. And you can trace that out of, uh, from all of our ancestors. People of Asian descent often are actually intolerant because that population left out for a long, long time before anybody else did. Humans with a lactose tolerance gene are the exception. Now, metabolic enzymes are found in your organs, your tissues, your blood, and they um, help you. They're, they're what's going to give you your energy. They're going to break down food in order to give you energy. Um, you need them to detox your body so that they can uh, metabolize all the toxins in your body. Um, but they're only found in living food. You have to consume live food. A living fruit, vegetable, seed, nut, whatever, it has to be alive in the process because enzymes eat when they're heated. Okay? So this bird here is a carnivore. They eat snakes and lizards and rodents and all kinds of things in the wild. So they're going to get their enzymes from the whole animal brain that they eat, probably the organs of their animal brains. And this is the tropical tortoises. They're going to tropical tortoises, like all herbivores, they're going to get their enzymes from the vegetables that they eat. Um, especially things like cactus and other things. So all raw foods have enzymes in them, but they die at 110 degrees or higher. It just happens to be the body temperature of a bird. Okay? Which means enzymes can't survive outside of the body at temperatures above body temperature. Okay? Now our enzymes are 290.6 degrees. Do your enzymes work very well when you have a high grade fever? No, they don't. Okay? That can cause a nausea and all kinds of things. You're not digesting food very well when you have a high grade fever. So your, your body's heating up trying to trying to you know get rid of whatever's causing the, the infection um, so that you can get back to normal. So meat for carnivores, plant sources for others. This is why dry dog kibble is bad. They heat it above 110 degrees, it kills all the nutrients. And I'll talk about meat in a second. But sprouts for your birds are the richest known source of these enzymes. So some of my favorites, the easy sprouts, are alfalfa, millets, sesame, sunflowers, quinoa, and wheat. Now, I don't like wheat dry, okay, for my birds. Uh, when you sprout it, it change its nutrition complement. Completely changed it. All of a sudden, it's this live food that's packed with nutrition. Um, vitamins will go up about 300 percent in a sprout versus a dry seed. Okay. But, um, you know things like sunflower. Sunflower, not the best dry food. Fantastic. Soaked, even just soaked overnight, it makes it hugely more nutritious. Okay, so this is still the Palooza at my house, and uh, I, I soak everything, including nuts, um, almonds and walnuts and things like that. Almonds and walnuts I soak for about six hours. Um, all of this stuff, all this stuff is dry. And when you soak it, you are allowing the enzyme inhibitors, the things that are keeping the enzymes from turning that seed into a plant, you're releasing them when you soak them. And then the plant is allowed to germinate from that seed. Capturing it right there, right when it's germinating, 
capturing it, that's when it's highest in its nutrients. So I tell everybody, everybody's, you know, and I just, I just uh, had a talk with someone earlier. So sprouting is a pain. It's time consuming for some seeds. But overnight and then rinsing and feeding is hugely more beneficial than feeding it dry. So if you don't want to sprout, you don't have that kind of time, just soak it, rinse it, feed it. How long will that stuff last? Um, I freeze it. I make six weeks at a time. Because I, uh, I have a lot to do. Uh, I sprout, and when I sprout, I will sprout, and I 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 sprout, and and sunflowers especially, they already have little green leaves on them. Quinoa is so overnight, it's got kale on it. Um, radish seeds sprout really fast. I mean, there's all kinds of things you can do. Um, it, it's just it's a matter of making your life comfortable, but giving your birds absolutely everything you possibly can. And that's why we do the, uh, the soaking and then Okay, I just wanted to comment. Don't go to your garden store and buy radish seeds yeah, or, 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 or in, because they yeah, have food grain, food grain, ah! human grain. Yeah. Okay. Um, so this is a giant bin on my patio, and I just I kitchen sink it. Now people all the time ask me. This is a close up. People all the time ask me, "What's your recipe?" I don't have a recipe. I don't want a recipe. I want to keep the birds guessing. So I don't want to give them the same thing every time. So what I do is I go to the store, I find what's available, I, I sow the sprout it, um, I get it all you know, prepared over a couple of days, and then I kitchen sink and I throw it all into a bin. And then I roll it in, and then I add the dry seeds to it for the flowers and the greens and things like that. So I kitchen sink it so that they have a ton of choices. There's over 40 different things in this mix. Okay, now are they going to get too much of any one thing? It's impossible. It's impossible to do here. Now, are the birds going to eat 100% of this? No. If there is 100% of it, that means there's not enough. There's still one. Of them. And if anybody ever tells you oh, my birds eat 100% of it, they're still hungry. We need to keep feeding them or give them something else. Um, but that is that's one of the mixes. So, just for example, I've got yellow squash in there. I've got a ton of different types of soap seeds, like um, sesame, bean, there's quinoa in there, there's some adzuki and bung beans, there's some chopped cactus pads in there, there's some uh, uh, microgreens, there's peppers, um, there is uh, chopped almonds, chopped walnuts, and that way they can not only eat, but they can also drink their nutrition. Brewery releases come out that may not readily be available in the first place. So, calendula, chamomile, and red clover, those are great anti inflammatories, high-invaded carotenes, things like that. We offer green tea and then flowers, deep flowers that are high in bioflavonoids, rose hips, rose petals, um, hibiscus. Uh, Tulsi is rich in antioxidants as well. Raspberry leaf is a hormone balance. We use that for all of our birds, especially birds that are from a lane because it helps their passing safely. Um, for detox, black tea, the tannins of black tea bind to um, uh, things like excessive iron in the diet and carry that out of the body. Uh, milk thistle, dandelion leaf, that supports organ function. Um, Chamomile and peppermint, very calming. Red rooibos is anti inflammatory. Uh, respiratory issues, you know, other anti inflammatories that are going to relax the very sensitive airways of birds. Uh, and then burning the fat. Fat oxidation. So we use decaf green tea, jasmine, hibiscus, things that are going to flush the system. So we add the tea right to the food. You can see the flowers in there. Um, we also soak some some of the things in the tea so that they absorb the tea. Um, things like rices and things like that will absorb the tea so that when they eat the rice, they're actually getting the nutritional benefits right out of the tea as well. Uh, we never use boiling water. Boiling water destroys nutrition. So we use hot water only and let it cool before we offer it. Uh, we do make bigger quantities in store in the fridge as well. Uh, we don't let them have any kind of tea bags. I don't know if you're aware of this, but tea bags, even if you are purchasing organic tea, the bags themselves are not organic. The bags themselves have chemicals in them, but they don't have to legally tell you that because you're not eating the bag. 
So um, that's that's um, something that people are often surprised about as well. But they, they chemical eyes and everything. So uh, if your bird's suspicious, you just make the teeth thinner. You have to trick them into good nutrition. You said that before, right? You got to trick them. That, that's that's the truth. Um, her her bird and my bird both drink their tea out of the mouth because that's what they see us drinking out of. And that was one way to trick them. He, God, if I put uh, if I put any tea into his water bowl, he'll he'll flip because he puts things in his water bowl. That's his job, not mine. So he does not like that. But um, like I said, you can substitute tea for other things and let them soak up the tea. Um, you can spray some of the teas right on your bird. Um, for pluckers, we offer the, the skin and feather tea. Um, we spray it right on them. Um, there's another one that has lavender and stuff in it. It's just very calming and you just smell it. It's, it's very relaxing. Um, we never completely replace water with tea. They always have water some part of the day. So my rule of thumb with tea is as long as you have the fresh food, you get tea. When you pull the fresh food, you give them fresh water. And then they get fresh water the rest of the day. And then many, many little teas can be fed dry. Actually, anything on this table um, here can be fed dry. You can feed it right in their dry food. I put it in there for foraging so they can forage through things. Some of them pick the flowers up first because they like the flowers. Um, there's lots of different there's lots of different functions. Yeah. After you have brewed your tea, after you brew it, away. don't throw it away. Throw it in your food. Absolutely. Use. I don't waste anything. I throw it all in. Um, I do this for my reptiles, my dogs and cats, I'm sorry, my dogs get uh, the tea as well. Um, so there's there's all kinds of things. And on beachbirdhouse.com, I do have a comprehensive list of peer-reviewed medical journals on tea, just in case anybody wants to uh, read, read through the medical journals. They're thrilling, trust me. Um, so vitamins, whole foods are the best way to get the vitamins. Um, a synthetic vitamin. If you're taking a multivitamin, you're probably just creating expensive urine. Um, it's a waste of money. You need to be getting your vitamins through your foods. And here's why. Synergistic compounds work together. So if you just take a vitamin C tablet, often you just pee it out. Because your body doesn't have the other compounds from the food that help you absorb your vitamin C. So synergistic is really important. Now they did a study on cranberries, for example, that showed that people that were taking cranberry extract from the, from the pharmacy um, did not have the same effect as whole cranberries because whole cranberries have these compounds that help the cranberry extract compound work. So by getting the raw foods, you're eating everything you need to absorb your food is in the food itself. And that's why it's food because everything's there. So adding other things in a pill form probably aren't going to do any good. Um, so taking vitamins in an isolated pillar powder probably not the best thing. Um, they, you definitely need to be getting those things from your food so your body knows what to do with them. Okay, I'm almost done, I promise. So nutrition, you need whole raw food in its natural state. You need fresh and clean food, unadulterated, unprocessed food, and you need a variety. What you don't need is added salt, fat, sugar, fried foods, dairy, additives, preservatives, pesticides, herbicides, and fungicides, okay? I know you know that. I'm just reminding you. Okay? Now, is this meant just for our pets? No, all of this applies to us because we are animals just like our pets. We just have different needs. So we need to present these types of food as biologically as appropriate as possible. Now, birds, Mother Nature is not stupid. She's not out there chopping food into little bite-sized pieces like I'm doing every week for hours. Um, but that makes life easier for me because I, I know that my birds are getting certain things. Okay, so biologically appropriate for me. Birds eat things that are hanging from trees. Right? I mean, that's what they do. So skewers are awesome. Okay? Birds also um, have different ways of doing things. So knowing your birds, your species' natural history, and finding out what do they do and how are they getting their food, what are they doing with it when they have it is very helpful. Um, there's different types of receptacles that you can use. Now, plates are great. Bowls for grazers and browsers. Um, grazers are birds that we eat off the ground. Browsers are birds that we eat from trees. Some do both. Um, like, you know, grays come to mind. Um, hanging them and things like that. Beat boxes, which is what I have on the table over here, the foraging devices. Um, I put food in there and make them work for it. And they go through that grass. And 
that grass is the only residue-free plastic turf that we can find that's played a huge role. It is so hard to find, but the birds love it, and it's super easy to clean. And so we've started using some of the small items in there and just rubbing it into the turf, and then they spend hours going through the turf trying to, trying to get it all out of there. It's pretty fun. Um, but, you know, giving them some kind of enrichment. The K-Tech sells the uh, foraging devices, where, and they're machine washable, so you can just, you know, put anything you want in there and just wash them like you would any of your dishes. Um, and then they have these foraging toys that make the birds work for their toys. So there's lots of different options on how to present the food to your birds. And birds want the challenge, trust me. You think you're doing them a service by putting them all in, in the easiest to get to place. Sometimes birds want to hang upside down and eat. That's just what they want to do, because that's what they do in the wild. It's their natural history. So for herbivores and omnivores, as much organic food as you can get, sprouts and other fresh foods, teas, nuts, and oils, all these things are great to add to the diet. Okay? And they're necessary. For carnivores, raw food to the form of meat, raw bones, um, which are often, if you're purchasing raw meat diets at the store, the bone is ground in already. Uh, teas and supplemental oils as well. Okay? So all of our birds experience stress because stress is a part of life. And birds need to be taught how to cope with stress. Okay? You will never eliminate all the stressors from your bird's environment. Even if you leave the green house, there is just toxins and everything exposed. We're all, ex all exposed to these stressors, okay? So we need to learn how to cope with these stressors, okay? And your kids need, your human children need to learn how to cope with these stressors. We're taking all the stressors away from them, and then they're 26 and they're still living in your basement. Yeah, we need to do something about this. I'm seeing this from a teacher standpoint. It's terrifying, but we are not, we, we want to take all the stress away. But stress is an important way to learn how to cope with life. And our birds need that just as, just as bad. So, the more vitamins they're getting from the food, the better they can cope. Okay? The nutrition is where the stress reduction comes in naturally. And the best way is raw, unprocessed foods. Nutritional variety, you absolutely have to have variety. Your birds should be seeing dozens of different types of things a day. Um, and supplying the best nutrition that you possibly can in the way of healthy food. Is, is um, going to ensure that they, have, they can get to that thriving point, not just survive. Okay, now my shameless plugs. Please join AFA. We have applications here. AFA, the American Federation of Agriculture, who's a member of AFA? Awesome. Please join. If anyone is watching the legislation, I'm, I'm, I'm taking the rights of birds to own birds away. I have two birds that are illegal in my state that I have to secure an educational permit for that I didn't have to do two years ago. Please consider joining, it's critical. I have it, there you go. And Georgia is our new regional director for AFA. So, congratulations to Georgia for that. And she holds her eyes as the first vice president in my Okay, um, I do have the DVD of a talk that's similar to this at afabirds.org that you can purchase if you, if you want to see if you want to see me again. I'm not sure you want to. Um, we also have online courses that you can learn more about birds as well. Um, my, Let's mark it as online educational information available at no charge. Yes, I do educational so programs online. that are free of charge. Yes, yeah. anybody can use Thanks them. Thanks to Jason. Yep. Um, Avian Rumble Food Nutrition is my Facebook group. If you're not a member already, join. We have almost 1,800 members now since I started this in January. There's no drama on the group at all. Zero drama. Yes, I'm serious. You There's no drama. Off. It's like everybody's on camera. It's awesome. So uh, if you're interested, just search Avian Raw. Avian Raw, and it'll take you right to my ugly mug, and you can join. Um, it's, uh, it's been a great group. We've got a lot of participants and people offering lots of different options. Um, okay, I know I answered a lot of questions already. I will answer more questions if you have them. Yeah. If you think you have a bird that has uh, allergies, is there any obvious sign? Signs of allergies. Um, Allergies manifest in ways in many different ways. So um, it's hard to say. I have, I have a client in Florida who has her birds outside year round, and she has two Amazons who um, have respiratory allergies. And they put her up. Uh, I put her on a, a respiratory tea here that we put together, and their allergies disappeared. 
But as soon as she stops offering them the tea, the allergies come right back the next day. Uh, so they're obviously in some kind of environmental thing that, that you know they're responding to. As far as food allergies, typically that's undigested food. It's vomiting. Um, I mean, it can manifest themselves in a lot of different ways. When I had a grade, I, was, I found out my elimination was allergic to sunflower seeds. Raw, cooked, now it didn't make any difference. Any form of sunflower seed, and he would strip that up from his body. Well, yes, so, and this that doesn't mean that he was caused by an allergy. Itching. itching doesn't necessarily mean allergies. It could be an omega 3 deficiency. Um, I mean, I would, I would hit them with, I would assume it's just fat, and I would hit them that way. You may eliminate the allergy just by offering that good health plan. And, and the stuff that is not in, so it's a good <laughs> Other questions? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Okay, so the fruit's different, I eat it once a week. The vegetables, sprouts, soap, seeds, all that stuff is a different um, The fruit I have to do once a week is the tree as well. So I get those in those plastic containers. Um, I think, have you guys heard of lock and lock? Okay, whoever designed those should receive the Nobel Prize. Um, because they keep fruit fresh. So it's got that blue rubber lining with the four snaps on the sides. Fruit all over. The vegetables, the sprouts, all that stuff. I have six weeks worth. I freeze it into bags that will last in the fridge for two days only. So with the number of birds I'm feeding, it's typically the gallon size freezer bag. I just make as many of those as I can, store them in the fridge, I take it out, and then I use that for two to three days. Where do you recommend the shop? So, uh, like, uh, I don't have a favorite store. As far as produce, you have to go multiple. You usually have to go multiple places to get good produce. Um, typically, I've got it here around the two to two stores. Now, I don't know if you have Whole Foods or Whole Foods. Um, if you want to file bankruptcy, go there and buy all the produce. Um, but I find that I can to buy a few food items there because I can find organic food and else at larger stores. Walmart has organic section. Uh, I think all these some of all these do. Uh, they both have organic sections. And there's the, the the general stores are are now Seen a need for organic produce, so almost every single one has an organic section. Hydroponic vegetables. Hydroponic aquaponics. She was saying that she works for an organic company that does organic like, aquaponics or hydroponics. Like, no, we just carry, I work for the company. You carry the bus. Oh, okay. How much you know how so, much you that is? I don't have gardens. Greenscape? Greenscape gardens. Okay. If you're in the St. Louis area, they're right here at Garden Center and they're staying in the bus. We're on the water. I, I, I have a towel that has aquaponics and I have to get a solution to the water that she has. But what we're finding is that the soils are so depleted from conventionally grown stuff that they are getting the same amount of time in most cases. You guys are incredibly patient. I'll be here.
here at the table, we have a pleasure. Um, thank you for coming and listening.